Hello, my name is Benjamin Denniston with the LaRouche Political Action Committee Scientific Research Team. And I am here today. I'm very happy to be joined with Professor Sergei Poulinets speaking to us from Moscow over Google Hangouts for a very special uh, interview discussion on the subject of technologies that can be used to control weather and increase rainfall to help address the drought and water crises going on in places like California, other places in the United States, but also other places around the world. Obviously, this is a very important issue now, given the water shortage in the western United States, but also globally. Um, so we're very happy to be joined here to be able to discuss some new technologies, new frontier ideas that can help mankind uh, manage the atmospheric resources, the, the, the water resources of the sky, potentially, and begin to uh, give mankind potentially an ability to increase rainfall where it is needed and, and secure the water supplies for various regions. Now, Professor Poulinets, um has some important background and familiarity with, with uh, these technologies and um, some of the theories behind how these technologies work to allow mankind to stimulate rainfall with uh, ionization systems. Uh, Professor Poulinets has been involved with a company in the United States called Rain on Request which is promoting the utilization of these technologies in the United States. Uh, he's also written on the subject, including a article that was published in Russia Beyond the Headlines in 2009, entitled, Weather Control, Yes, It Is Really Possible. Uh, earlier, he had, Mr. Professor Poulinets had worked uh, as part of a team assessing the validity and the scientific basis for some of these um, weather control systems in Mexico uh, in the late 90s and the early 2000s. So, I'm, again, I'm very happy to be joined with Mr. Poulinets today. Uh, this is, I think is going to be a very useful and helpful discussion um, for this uh, current water situation. And to start off, I would like to, to ask, ask you, Mr. Poulinets, because you know, clearly this issue is met with a lot of skepticism. If you bring this up, a lot of people uh, have a very quick reaction to just dismiss the idea that we can control these things, such as weather processes, rainfall. Um, but you have done work actually assessing the scientific uh, basis for some of these systems that have been operational for many years, and which have been reported to show success in increasing rainfall in Mexico. So I was hoping we could just start by hearing about the, the history of your familiarity with these systems and uh, 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 your understanding of where they've worked and uh, how, how well they've been successful so far. Hello, Ben. Uh, hello to everybody. I would like to clarify a little bit the situation. Actually, my background it is a space physics, mm -hmm. and uh, starting from the end of 90s, uh, we started to uh, learn about the effects in the ionosphere which are associated with the earthquakes was very interesting how the information from the ground that even underground penetrates to uh, our space and I started to develop the theory about this. And to do this, I should be involved into geophysics, in the solid geophysics, what happens before the earthquakes. And for the first time, I uh, encountered the problem of the ionization which is created by the radon emanating from the Earth's crust 
and increase of this emanation before the earthquakes. Radon can produce the ionization of air uh, near the ground surface. And then this heat is propagating up to the upper layers of atmosphere up to the tropopause. Uh, another thing, it is the uh, effects of the cosmic rays. Uh, probably uh, you know that the clouds which cover our planet in great extent are formed due to galactic cosmic rays which produce the ionization. And then the ions become the centers of water vapor condensation and nucleation and formation of drops and clouds uh, which we see every day. And there is correlation between the cloud coverage of our planet and the variations of the fluxes of the cosmic rays. So, nature uh, gives us uh, the answer that ionization can produce the nucleation. We have these examples from space, galactic cosmic rays, and from the ground, from the nature of radioactivity. And uh, we can see, for example, uh, the results of studies of Japanese scientists who, through the uh, discharge from the needle, uh, created the flux of the ions and put them in the mass spectrometer and were able to see how grow the particles and if you look at the picture you will see the distance between the uh, sequential spectrum lines in atomic mass it is 18 it is the uh, atomic mass of the water molecule and you see how ions gains more and more and more water molecules and it was proved experimentally. So this, uh, let's say, the theoretical background, how the ionization can produce the large uh, clusters where in center we have the ion and the envelope from the water molecule. I came to Mexico and was working in the Institute of Geophysics of UNAM. You know, it is the greatest university in Mexico City. Uh, working on the problem of the uh, earthquakes. But uh, there I met some friends uh, who uh, may be familiar with some, uh, some Mexican company named ELAT which uh, made the experiments with, with the stimulation of the uh, uh, rains. They had the contracts with the governments of different states, especially in the drought areas of Mexico, so in Sonora Desert, uh, to produce uh, the rains uh, to increase the harvest in, in, this, in these areas. And it is very interesting that the main idea and main ideology was proposed also by a Russian scientist, Lev Pochmilnik, who was the founder of this company and uh, was supported by uh, Mexican businessmen and uh, uh, primarily by the mayor of Mexico City. And... <coughs> Because the physical mechanism is the same, simply the sources of ionization are different. We have radon before the earthquakes and they uh, have a special installation which produces artificial uh, ionization. So uh, we started to cooperate. And uh, I was familiar with uh, their results. 
actually I can provide you some pictures with their results and they are very impressive. And after that I became the member of the scientific committee where I represented the representatives of the uh, Mexican Meteorological Agency scientists uh, working in the physics of atmosphere. There was one scientist from United States. Uh, I can give you the list of the scientists who involved in this committee who uh, had the purpose to estimate if the effects produced by this company are real. And I participated in several meetings of this committee uh, where we discussed the results. So, uh, what is the, uh, how to say, how looks <laughs> this installation? It is a uh, higher mast uh, near 30 meters from which, like a race, the very thin wires go. Uh, why very thin? We know that the uh, if we take the needle, for example, before the thunderstorms, when we have the higher voltage, high electric field in atmosphere, we sometimes can see the discharge from, from the needle. So now, let us imagine that we have the ends of needle connected in the th thin wire and uh, the smaller diameter of this wire, the more effective you can glow the coronal discharge, putting the higher electrical voltage on, on, on this wire. So, uh, you create something like umbrella from this mask, and you have peripheral um, uh, shorter mask, and you have this installation and put the higher voltage uh, which produce ionization of air and then if you have uh, positive put positive or negative potential on this uh, installation with this electric field for example if you put positive potential so the positive ion will be moved by the electric uh, field up to the upper layers and moving uh, to the upper layers, they gain more and more water molecules and become uh, the uh, nucleus to form the clouds. Actually, for example, uh, we can see even these effects before earthquakes when the linear clouds are formed over the tectonic faults. And this effect is observed everywhere and reported by many scientists. This is the same effect by the electric field that the ions produced by the ionization by radon go up and form the linear clouds over the active tectonic field. The two words. <laughs> this is the explanation of this technology. Of course, it is... Uh, stands the physics uh, behind this, but I should uh, underline one very important thing. Mm -hmm. We know the technology of so-called cloud uh, seeding, mm -hmm. when from iris, uh, airplane you disperse, uh, for example, uh, silver iodine or even you can disperse the cement. Uh, because uh, um, any dust or aerosols in air become the center of condensation and you stimulate the uh, precipitation of rain. But the difference between these two technologies is following. By seeding, you can precipitate only uh, this water that, uh, which already exists in air and you cannot create nothing more and here you create the new nucleus and you take 
the water vapor and collect it in, into the drops. And if you put the, your installation uh, near the seashore, for example, in California, you can very easily to put this installation near the shore, you can collect the humidity and then transport it because you can put the different potentials between two installations it creates the movement of this air filled by the uh, this nucleus for formation of clouds inland so actually if we are now speaking on the technology you can take the uh, water from ocean to move it to inland and then create the precipitation. But to create precipitation, you should create some conditions, uh, relationships between the uh, temperature in the uh, altitude of clouds and dew temperature. Hmm. So you should have the, your temperature lower than dew temperature to condensate it creates the drops and create such kind of instability which in nature we have in the thunderstorms. Actually, uh, all the people and sometimes physicists of atmosphere are thinking in the terms of the hydrodynamics. For example, describing the typhoons, hurricanes, they um, look only at the hydrodynamics, mechanical movement, but they forget that we are living in the electrical world. Mm. There are huge electric potential on the top of the hurricane. They, uh, we live in the constant electric field which exists between the ionosphere and ground. The potential difference between the ionosphere and ground is near 250 kilovolts and sometimes it can gain 400, 500 kilovolts. And on the ground surface, the vertical gradient of the electric field is 100 or 150 volts per meter. So you are a tall guy, so <laughs> <laughs> between your uh, legs and head, you have 200 volts the potential difference all the time. So uh, uh, this uh, potential difference is created by thunderstorm activity globally. So thunderstorm activity charges the ionosphere positively in relation to the Earth and in areas of fair weather we uh, have the return fair weather current which is very low but never, uh, nevertheless we have the closed electric circuit which is uh, uh, called in science global electric circuit. And simply we use everything what is given for us by nature helping a little bit uh, with this ionization to create the additional uh, centers of nucleation. Now it is exists uh, the direction of science which is named ion-induced nucleation effect, mm. which is explosive nucleation uh, in uh, presence the source of the ionization. So you can produce these centers of condensation and your task to transport it to the altitude of clouds formation and then create the conditions to precipitate this. Hmm. It, just to clarify for our, our audience here, so I think just to maybe take a couple steps back, you're, you're saying, so we start with the fact that there's, on the one side there's already a lot of uh, water vapor, evaporated yes. water in the atmosphere. So on the one side with these ionization systems you can create the conditions which accelerate or increase the rate at which that water, that evaporated water condenses and forms liquid droplets, which can help 
in, in, in the initial state, it is not droplets yet, but nucleation centers. Uh -huh. Yes, they are very small to call them droplets. It is a complex process to, from, from, from the ion to larger particle to the ion cluster, then uh, nucleation, uh, and uh, then the droplet. And you had and said a, 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 the same process as formation of the clouds in, in natural conditions. Simply, you form it near the ground surface and and then uh, transport them up with electric field. And you had said that uh, Japanese scientists have done experiments demonstrating the 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 role of increased ionization in facilitating this process. Yes. Yes, uh, uh, they uh, published several papers and I can provide you these publications with the figures showing how these uh, particles uh, grow. And it is very interesting and uh, uh, I should also underline that contrary to the pure condensation which needs the saturated water vapor, 100 percent humidity, hmm. pure water to have condensation. This process is called ions hydration, attachment of the water molecules to the ion, and uh, you can see from their pictures that this process takes place in any level of the relative humidity. Even you have humidity 25%, you still will have the uh, formation of uh, these ion clusters with attached water molecules. Of course, the larger humidity, the more effective process yes, we have. The larger uh, particles are formed. But in general, hydration takes place in any level of humidity. Mm -hmm. And then so, you... Uh, even in, uh, in uh, low humidity conditions, you can uh, create the large particles and precipitate them in the form of dew, for example. Mm. And for the plants, it is uh, doesn't matter if you have rain or you have dew; they can gain the water even from dew. Hmm. Then you had also said so that's in addition to helping to induce what atmospheric moisture is there to 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 come down, either to precipitate or to come form as dew. You can also induce more flows of moisture to come in. From over the ocean, you can actually increase the water availability in the atmosphere too. Yes, and uh, uh, I provided you the pictures from the Mexican experiments. Mm -hmm. You see the line of uh, installations uh, perpendicular to the shore, starting from the Pacific. And uh, this line helped to move the mass of the air filled with the humidity inland of the Mexico. Hmm. And so you had said, based on your, your work, these systems in Mexico have shown some pretty impressive results. Yes, uh, you, you can see there the results of uh, filling on dubs of the hydroelectric power plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were three dumps, and there are uh, results for one and a half years, and you can see how these dumps were filled up with this knowledge. Actually, they also tried to fight with the uh, forest fires in the Yucatan Peninsula, creating the artificial rains to fight with the forest fires. Uh-huh. And they also had success in doing that? 
Yes, uh, there are some such statistical results showing the decrease of the forest fires uh, during the period of the activity. You may have something like 20, 30 percent increase of precipitation, if not uh, that you create the heavy rains, you see, but you can increase the, uh, in essential manner, the number of the water precipitation. Maybe just to step back also, you had said early on that this is uh, very similar to what occurs naturally with uh, the radiation coming in from the galactic system. And uh, I think maybe, maybe we could take a few minutes to, to discuss that because that is kind of a relatively new area of study where we're starting to, to learn and understand that the effects of what the sun is doing then also the effects of the high energy radiation from the galaxy are actually a constant input uh, 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 shaping the environment of the atmosphere, um, affecting climate, weather, affecting how water uh, moves through the water cycle. Um, so you had said that the, the, the basis of these ionization technologies is actually acting on a, on, on a very similar uh, area as the ionizing effects of the galaxy. Can you say more about that? Yes. Um, the uh, any energetic particle uh, with energy high <coughs> than the ionization uh, uh, energy of ionization of molecules of air which is from 10 to 15 electron volts so any particles uh, which are, have energy higher than this energy can ionize the water molecule if we speaking in the uh, on the cosmic uh, sources of ionization we have two main sources this our star sun and uh, the galactic cosmic rays which have much more higher energy and the altitude of penetration of these particles into the atmosphere depends on the energy of particles the solar particles have lower energy so they cannot actually penetrate to the lower layers of atmosphere and they lose their energy at the altitudes say from several tens to hundred kilometers so this is a source of uh, northern lights mm -hmm. because they excite the molecules and atoms uh, actually in these altitudes we are now speaking about atoms of oxygen and nitrogen and we see the green and red lines of the uh, polar lights but the galactic cosmic rays which have much more higher energy decay at the okay they have the peak uh, altitude peak where they uh, lost the main energy on the altitude of the tropopause this from 10 to 15 kilometers this is the altitudes of the top of the clouds of our atmosphere so uh, these are the layers of where the clouds are formed and um, the first good statistical results uh, were made by uh, Svensmark uh, it is a uh, Danish uh, scientist uh, who showed the force period something like two cycles of solar activity yeah 22 years the 
cross correlation coefficient near 95% between the variations of the galactic cosmic rays fluxes and coverage, cloud coverage of our planet. And now uh, this theory is developed very uh, well, showing how the uh, formed a primary ions, then they enter into the chemical reaction, create the final ions, and these final ions became to be hydrated and form the nu nucleus uh, clouds. So this uh, theory is well developed and. Probably you have heard uh, the uh, large, huge, you can say, <laughs> camera created in CERN, in Switzerland, where they study this process of, of the cloud formation. But they spent a lot of money, and I prefer the experiment of Japanese, which is very simple, but very clever, showing this process very clear. Mm. So, and uh, mm, what is uh, very interesting that uh, sometimes uh, physicists who are working in this field do not take into account uh, another effect connected with the ionization. It is a release of latency. You know that the water molecules free in the air, which in air exists as a gas, and water molecule uh, in water have different energy. And this difference between free, so we say that uh, water uh, can exist in three phases. It is gas, liquid, and solid. So water vapor, water as we drink, and ice. Mm. And between them, uh, there is a difference in energy of water molecules, which we do not see. That's why we call it latent heat. Mm. So, uh, for example, to evaporate. Uh, you know this is a proverb that watch it pot will never boil. Mm -hmm. Because it seems you reached 100 degree temperature but you wait and wait and wait until uh, the uh, vapor uh, starts to be emitted from the water. This is the period when the water molecules gain this latent heat to evaporate, to become free from water. And we have backward process. When the water is condensed, it releases the uh, heat into the environment. So uh, that's why in the Asian countries, we, we see uh, the, uh, a lot of fountains, and probably you have also in California uh, the special water systems, because uh, to uh, water uh, from fountains starts to evaporate, and it absorbs the heat and decreases the te temperature in this area. That's why. Uh, we create the fountain uh -huh. uh -huh. to, to decrease a little bit the temperature uh, where, where we have hot climate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, uh, if we deal with the ionization, we have the same effect. When the ions are, con uh, when the water contains on ions, it releases the heat. But uh, if you decrease the condensation, you will decrease the temperature in this place. 
that's why uh, it was uh, discovered the connection of the uh, sharp decrease of galactic cosmic rays fluxes during the magnetic storms with formation of the hurricanes. Hmm. Again, in Mexico, I have a good colleague, uh, Jorge Perez Peraza, who is working on the connection of the fluxes of galactic uh, cosmic rays and formation of the hurricanes in in Atlantic uh, and Pacific uh, Mexico area, and he has very good statistics show that when you have a lot of uh, forbus decrease, so active sun, many magnetic storms, this increase the probability of formation of the tropical cyclones and hurricanes. Hmm. Because, and we published the paper showing the physical mechanism. If you have decrease of the uh, uh, fluxes of uh, galactic cosmic rays, you decrease the temperature on the level of tropopause, and in such a way, you increase the temperature difference between the surface of the ocean and tropopause. So you sharply increase convection and help to hurricanes to form due to increased convection. Hmm. I think this is a kind of remarkable thing you're, you're saying is that these high energy particles coming from not coming from our earth not coming from our star you know coming from all regions of of the of the interstellar space and the galaxy are actually playing an active role in things like the strength of hurricanes or hurricane formation yes 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 and uh, there is uh, was discovered another effect of uh, modulation of fluxes of galactic cosmic rays with uh, periods of glaciers, uh, ice ages, uh, in long term history of our planet. And uh, they were able to demonstrate that it could be, okay, this hypothesis could be connected with movement of the solar system in the arms of our spiral uh, galactic. And when the uh, solar system is inside the arm, there is uh, more dust, so the less, less flux of the galactic cosmic rays. And between the arms, uh, uh, we have the larger fluxes of the galactic cosmic rays. And these periods coincide temporarily with periods of increase and decrease temperature of our planet. All these ionization effects, these cosmic radiation effects that, that you're describing here, that they're, they're constantly creating certain conditions in our atmosphere that affect how water vapor behaves, that affect how weather uh, behaves, that affect climate. Yes, and I should not forget uh, that uh, um, more clouds, you can have the shadow on the Earth. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the temperature variation uh, uh, is connected not only with the direct uh, heat created by cosmic rays, but with the shadow. More clouds, more shadow. Less clouds, you are open to the sun. So these variations of temperature connect. We said they were also essential. Well, I just have to say this kind of redefines what we should mean when we think of the Earth's climate because it's not, it, it's it's more like a, a solar and galactic climate than just an Earth climate. We should take into account both of them. You see, we, we cannot say that it's only galactic, but uh, galaxy create some contribution to the variations of climate and climate. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that the this 
work being done with these ionization systems is a way that uh, we can begin to affect these types of parameters and create our own influence on these weather systems, the, the water cycle, and utilize that to, uh, to our own benefit. Yes, I think so. It is possible, but we should do it very, very carefully. I suppose that there should be state or administrative control of such kind of because influence on the environment could be dangerous. You should have some limits because you can create huge installation to make very large ionization depending on the polarity which you put on the antenna. You can increase the number of clouds or increase the number of clouds. Somebody will want to have a uh, resort, uh, have a lot of sun, another one wants to produce grapes and have rains and <laughs> they could be neighbors <laughs> and fight what you have to have clouds or don't have clouds. Uh, so it should be, <laughs> this activity should be regulated, of course. Well, what, what, would you, what would you think should be the next step for developing these systems in a um, you know, as you're saying, in a in a mature and uh, regulated way, because I think this opens up a, a whole new potential, obviously, for how mankind can can deal with these challenges like droughts or like uh, bad weather occurring that causes you know excess flooding. Um, you know, this this is a growing major issue. W water is a huge issue, not just for the United States, but globally. There's many places in the world that are uh, lacking fresh water or they lack regular supplies. They get rain, and they get drought, they get a little bit of rain again and drought. It seems like what, what you're defining here is a incredibly important perspective for how we could begin to, you know, in a responsible regulated way, we could begin to um, manage water in a completely new way by managing how it operates in the atmosphere, not just how it operates once it lands on ground. So, uh, from your standpoint, what do you think would be the next steps to begin to develop this in a responsible manner? I suppose uh, we should organize the open and clear uh, distinct experiments on this uh, with uh, good uh, scientific support the scientists to be able uh, to control and to see that such kind of effects really exist. Because, uh, let's say, <laughs> traditional atmospheric scientists or meteorologists sometimes say that possible. So we should at least make this experiment to demonstrate it to first to the scientific community a second to the public that there's no danger in this. These effects are uh, not more dangerous than natural electric field. I, I know that uh, in some experiments in Mexico, uh, the cows came close <laughs> to this installation because they have a better feeling inside this uh, electric field. So huh. this is a proof <laughs> that it is not a danger for nature and for birds. Birds feel very well the electric field, so they, they will not approach to this installation. And maybe also, we've been mostly discussing the the activity that went on in Mexico. <clears throat> but there are other companies and other places where these systems have been demonstrated, isn't that correct? Yes. I know uh, that such companies exist in Saudi Arabia, uh, probably in Australia, uh, maybe s some were in 
Russia, but they are not doing active experiments. I know that there were uh, experiments on ionization in Japan during five years, uh, but uh, they were not connected with the uh, rains. Uh, they were connected with the uh, uh, dispersing fogs in the mountain roads of Japan. Mm. So you uh, create participation in the decrease the fog to in to improve the movement in tunnels and high mountains where uh, the fog is formed very often. Well, how long do you think it would take to get a demonstration system set up, say, to uh, maybe in the region somewhere in California to, to demonstrate the validity of, of this technology? Actually, to put the installation takes one, two weeks. And uh, I suppose we need at least one year to check different seasons. You see winter, autumn, spring, summer, where we have the optimal conditions for cre uh, to create favorable conditions for this precipitation. And you, you should take into account also the plant calendar if we want to with uh, uh, farmers uh, farmers who need also the rains and so not only for drinking but for, for agriculture also so uh, but it seems to me that uh, one year will be enough mm -hmm. For experiments. Well, again, I mean, I think this is a very exciting and important perspective to be discussing, you know, in the context of the drought in California, the water needs of other places in the world, that there are these technologies, and as you're discussing, there is the theory behind these technologies, which can enable mankind to begin to um, address these problems in a new way. <clears throat> so I think we did not discuss this uh, in this presentation because, okay, it should be presented in scientific conferences. I mm -hmm. said only the general things how it happens. But physics uh, is not very complex, but at least you have you need to have some background understand these processes. And you, you have said that your work in studying earthquake precursors and how the lithosphere and the atmosphere and the ionosphere interact in the preparation process for earthquakes has, the, the theoretical framework you've developed in studying that has <clears throat> very, very valid applications for this um, weather control as well. Yes, because uh, it is the same physical process and even the same environment because the installation is near the ground. So we have uh, only the different sources of ionization. Well, I think this is a very exciting and important perspective that we're discussing here. Um, and I also think just because we're, we're speaking now from the United States to Russia, I think this is this is also an important area that we can have uh, productive and healthy international collaboration in, in yes, this area. Yes, and I suppose in, in conditions which we have today, it probably may help us to improve our relationships, which a little bit go down during uh, the, the few months the last year and this year. But yeah. uh, this always our cooperation, for example, in space, in the International Space uh, Station, and in physics at all, was all the times not depending on any condition, was very firm, was very friendly. And I suppose we should maintain these relationships. Certainly seems like a key area because we're defining 
how mankind can address problems that are you know bigger than any one nation. You know, drought's not just an issue for one part of the world and not the other. These these are the types of things that all mankind should be thinking about. Yes, of course, it is a global problem, and all nations should unite to improve living conditions. Well, do you have anything else to add in conclusion? I really appreciate you taking the time to go through some of the science and, and, and your uh, uh, background in this area. I think it's very important. And I also want to thank you that you find me and give me possibility to explain uh, how we can uh, fight with the droughts. Uh, it's okay. It is, we need too much money for this installation. It's not cheap. Relatively cheap to, to do. It's not an incredibly expensive operation. For example, of in comparison with the seeding from airplanes, this order of magnitude. Uh huh. Well, I thank you again for for joining us, Professor Pullen. That's always a pleasure to get a chance to speak to you and get your uh, understandings on these things. Thank you, Ben, and welcome to visit us. Ha! <laughs> if you <laughs> will have such possibility. I, w I would be very happy to. <clears throat> well, I thank you, and um, thank you for tuning in, and uh, we will have more on this very important subject on LaRouchePack.com. Thank you for joining us.